Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so we are back again on uh, what is going to be probably the last uh, main topic of uh, CT 111. Uh, this topic uh, that we'll be looking at now is going to be a departure from the earlier topics that we have seen, uh, mainly the channel coding. Some of it was related to modulation, maybe some probability theory, information theory. We did some source coding, etc. Uh, what we are going to do next is going to be more signal oriented. We are going to be considering uh, signals instead of just bits. Uh, and we are going to see what is the way we can synthesize signals. For example, if there is a voltage signal in time domain, uh, maybe it's a sinusoidal signal, uh, it's a wavy signal uh, in the time domain, or maybe it is a rectangular signal, it's a triangular signal. There are many different waveforms, so to speak, uh, that a communication transmitter can generate and a communication receiver would receive. And so we'll be looking at uh, the signaling aspect of our communication system in a little more detail. Um, a part of this is, I, I, I emphasize that although our discussion will be centered on the communication systems, uh, I would say that a part of it is intimately related to, again, artificial intelligence systems, AI systems, machine learning, etc. The reason being is that we as humans all the time deal with signals. We don't deal with bits as such as much actually, if you think about it. When we speak, our speech is actually a signal, an audio signal. When we uh, watch uh, some video, that video is also a signal. In fact, our what, uh, what our eyes see all the time, uh, the scenes from the natural world, uh, they are actually converted to elect uh, electrical stimulus by our uh, the, by the retina in our eyes, and those signals then eventually reach our brain, and our brain is able to figure out the visual image uh, and the visual uh, scenery that it sees, and so our brains all the time deal with signals, and so no wonder the AI systems and the machine learning uh, community also has to. Uh, come to grips with the signaling aspect, the the structure of the signals, how to properly uh, mathematically model the signals, etc. And uh, and so that is why this topic, although it is part of CT communication theory uh, topic, uh, it has a very uh, strong uh, affinity to the AI and the machine learning. So again, a very highly relevant topic for, for today's world, not only in terms of communication systems, not only in terms of 5G and uh, future next generation communication system design, but also uh, in terms of uh, AI design. Okay, so without further ado, let us, uh, I'll, I'll minimize my uh, screen as we do usually, and then we'll jump right into uh, the main topic that we'll be studying next. Okay, so uh, uh, this is our seventh topic, and I, although I've called it the topic of Fourier transformation, it actually uh, is going to be uh, basically looking at uh, the signaling aspects, as I just now mentioned. Okay, so in this lecture uh, slides, we are going to actually start with the convolution operation, which all of you must be very familiar with now now that you have done the convolution encoding and convolution decoding. But now we are going to take a look at a generalized convolution operation and, and then we'll see how it relates very intimately to the Fourier transformation. And that will allow us to get into the topic of Fourier transformation. We will look at some, some properties of Fourier transformation and then we'll see the applications in uh, modulation and, and sampling theories. Okay. Uh, now, as you read these slides, uh, and the slides are standalone, uh, you, you should be able to understand the content of the slides by itself. Uh, but you are highly encouraged, actually, you are required 
to continuously refer to the textbooks. And the two good, very good textbooks are the book by uh, Leon Couch, the 8th edition, and by Professor Epomanyu Madhu. Uh, and he has written a very nice book called Introduction to Communication Systems. This is actually available online. And I have listed here several sections of these two textbooks that you should be uh, studying in depth. What we will be covering is mostly the theoretical aspects, maybe some examples, uh, but I, I strongly encourage you to do the examples that are in this textbook. I'll be actually giving you some uh, examples as a part of your um, uh, homework assignment as we move along. Okay, so uh, this is the diagram of uh, the physical layer of communication systems that uh, you all have seen multiple times earlier. And you know that uh, we have covered the topic of source coding and channel coding in the prior lectures. We haven't had uh, too much of an opportunity to do the encryption part of it. Let us see, maybe we might uh, have some 10 or 20 minute video on, on the encryption later on. But for the time being, our focus is uh, going to be on the topic of modulation and demodulation, which is partially covered in the previous lectures. Uh, but now we are going to be actually studying uh, the topic of modulation and uh, demodulation in further depth. And the good thing about this approach that we have taken here, where we'll be focusing on the Fourier transformation, but that Fourier transformation uh, as an entire topic uh, is, is going to get uh, studied in the context of signals uh, and systems. And so that will allow us to not only uh, understand the topic of modulation uh, and even actually the channel, whether it is wireless channel that your cell phone sees or whether it is a wireline channel that your uh, home uh, landline phone sees. Uh, that topic also will be explored in detail. Uh, but we also will be doing uh, a, a mathematical study of the sampling operation that is required at the very front end of the, uh, the system. And you know this is required because all the incoming information is generally analog in nature. Uh, and in order for us to be able to convert that analog information into digital data, as we have uh, mentioned this earlier on at the start of the semester, that uh, there is a need for do, to do uh, this A to D conversion, whose very first block is sampling block. And so we'll be getting into the theory behind the sampling operation. Okay, uh, so let us jump right into the topic of convolution. This is the uh, slide that you all should have studied in great depth. I've taken it from Professor Matthew Valentis. Uh, presentation and this is the formula uh, that you would have implemented as a part of your convolution encoder and this is the block diagram representation of this formula especially this formula here shows just one branch of this encoder and what this shows is the output of the encoder on any one branch can be given as uh, this mathematical equation which is uh, the equation of convolution and that is why this uh, channel coding scheme is called convolution coding okay um, so the convolution uh, operation is not uh, only limited to the channel encoder that you have implemented and studied as a part of the project uh, but it is uh, many other uses um, and uh, so if you look at its general expression uh, it is given as uh, what is shown here. Uh, so there is going to be a uh, certain uh, vector x of n and some other vector h of n. And the convolution between x of n and h of n is going to be always denoted by this star symbol. And the output of the convolution is going to get denoted as y of n. This is the formula, the generalized formula for convolution operation. 
And so we will be getting into the depth of what this formula says, what it implies and all. But what we want to mention now is that here this X and H need not be binary as we have taken uh, during our uh, project. Uh, now we are going to allow them to have any real or complex valued numbers. Um, and uh, essentially they will be forming a sequence of such numbers. Similarly, in our convolution encoder, y of n is also binary, but here y of n also will be a general real valued complex valued number. Furthermore, uh, we won't uh, require x of n and h of n to have some specific lengths. Uh, they can be arbitrary length, they can be even infinite as this summation limits indicate. Uh, the role played by x of n and h of n is interchangeable, but we are generally going to uh, denote the input as x of n. Uh, and we will be calling the system, we will be denoting the operation of the system uh, through h of n. In the convolution and encoding project, the system was the encoder and h of n was actually denoted there as generator, generator polynomial uh, g of n. Uh, now, uh, for the sake of uh, uh, using the nomenclature that is generally used in uh, the literature, we are going to replace g of n with h of n. And so now the output is just the convolution of the input and the system. Okay. Um, now, what we have uh, uh, represented on the previous slide was inputs and uh, the systems which have discretized time. But uh, this convolution operation is actually general. It, it does not require that uh, you have to op op operate only for discrete values of n, uh, which was the case in the previous equation and also in your convolution encoder project. Uh, the convolution operation actually uh, looks like this in the continuous time. The symbol is still the same, the star symbol. But now you see that instead of n, we are using the continuous time variable t. And uh, the summation got replaced by the integration. This is the, uh, the variable of the integration, tau. Uh, but otherwise, this term inside the integral uh, looks pretty similar to what we had with the discrete time. Uh, this variable k has been replaced by tau and n has been replaced by t. And therefore, you will see that uh, this equation looks quite similar to what we had for the discrete time case. And so, in the case of continuous time, the input and the system and the output all are continuous analog uh, signals. Um, there is no, no discretization of the time axis. Okay. Uh, now just some nomenclature. Uh, so in the discrete time, uh, the system is called linear and shift invariant. Uh, and in the continuous time, the system is called linear and time invariant. Uh, why it is linear, why it is called shift invariant that, that maybe we'll get into later. But this is just uh, for you to uh, keep in mind that when you when you refer to the textbooks, uh, if you see L, the terminology such as LSI or LTI, uh, all that they are referring to is uh, such a diagram where there is an input, there, there is a certain block which corresponds to a system and the output is convolution of the input and the system response. Okay, now in discrete time, this H of n uh, is called the impulse response uh, of the system. Uh, so the system is said to have an impulse response. And the reason it is called impulse response is because in case if you excite the system, uh, meaning that if you supply as the input to the system an impulse, 
where in discrete time the impulse is defined like this. It's called delta n, and its value is one when n is equal to zero, and everywhere else it is zero. So it's just one impulse at n equal to zero. Then the output that you get is same as h of n for the discrete time case. Whereas for this continuous time case, again the same thing. If you excite the system with a direct delta function delta of t then the output that you get the response response to this impulse delta of t is exactly h of t what it means is that what i have just mentioned uh, mathematically what it means is that output y of t when x of t is delta of t is exactly h of t Alternatively, delta t convolved with h of t gives you h of t back. Okay, so we will stop here, and uh, then we will continue uh, in the next video.